for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely o'er to Thy kingdom shore. To thy shore, just a closer walk with thee. Walk with thee, granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking. Close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord. Let it be. Lighting up the Pioneer Valley with the love and praise of Jesus Christ. We are WLPVLP, nonprofit low power radio at 107.9 on your. Well, good morning, everyone. It's Tuesday morning, and this is Mornings with Mike. I've just had a a really great uh, weekend leading into uh, this coming week while we're preparing uh, for a week of family camp up in White River Junction, Vermont. Many of our folks are packing up their campers and loading up their tents and and packing groceries away for the week to head up for a, a really wonderful time of fellowship uh, up along the Connecticut, the junction of the Connecticut and the White Rivers up in uh, White River Junction, Vermont. And uh, we're really looking forward to it. Our friend Joseph, Josephus Housey from Agawam, Massachusetts, Redeeming the Times Ministries, is going to be our speaker for the week. There will be Bible classes for adults and teenagers and a VBS program for children. Great fellowship. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're free in the evening uh, uh, and you want to drive up, it's only 65 miles from Brattleboro, uh, come up for an evening or two and just enjoy some really, really great fellowship. My uh, the staff up there is telling us that uh, the place is packed. There, there, there really is no more room in terms of our lodging. Uh, people are people are anticipating coming, and our, our lodging house is full. My daughter tells me that there's a few beds maybe left uh, uh, for. Uh, uh, for teens to come in for our YPI program. All the camper spots, RV spots, tent spots, everything are packed. We are looking forward to a great time. I'm in hopes that you will be in prayer for us as we enjoy this very, very special time that we enjoy the first week in August every year for more than 130 years now. Now, I haven't been to all of them, but I've been to a lot of them, and uh, it's really, really a wonderful place uh, to be. So, uh, and Saturday night, this coming Saturday night, uh, I think it's the 5th, is it? I, my dates, you know, we're having a, a great uh, worship team who's going to be opening our camp with a great worship night, One King Worship from over in the Keene area. Uh, Scott Bedard and Gina and his team are going to be up ministering to us on Saturday night. And then Pastor Josephus is going to begin uh, his preaching ministry on Sunday night. All of the services in the evening begin at 7 o'clock. We are right off the interstate. You get off at exit 12 as you go northbound on Interstate 91. And uh, the camp is located at 150 Advent Lane. Uh, if you want to come up for a day, uh, we, we serve meals all day long, uh, breakfast, lunch, and, and dinner. We do not charge for meals. We simply ask people to... Uh, to share a donation with us to cover the cost of food. It's a great opportunity. It's a great day away. If you can't come for the whole week, at least come uh, for a day or for an evening or two or whatever you can do. It'll be it'll be a great, great time. You know, last night I was, uh, I was praying, uh, spending some time with the Lord, and all of a sudden an old-fashioned uh, 
song, uh, a song that I used to sing. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to it and just uh, remind myself uh, of the words that, uh, that came to my heart. Uh, and it may bless you too. Here's the words, just the, the first words of this hymn. I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad. So glad he did. He left his mighty throne in glory to bring to us redemption story. Then he died, but he rose again. Oh, but I'm glad. So glad he did. And then the song goes on to say, where would I be if Jesus didn't love me? Where would I be? If Jesus didn't care, where would I be if he hadn't sacrificed his life? Oh, but I'm glad, so glad he did. You know, that just thrilled me. I, I used to sing that song with the Southern Airs Gospel Choir back in the, the 60s uh, when Barbara, my wife, and I sang with a very dynamic gospel choir called the Southern Airs Gospel Choir. My friend Phil Felton, who's the bass singer for the famous quartet, the Envoys, Dove Award-winning Envoys, uh, responded immediately and said, boy, that used to be one of the favorite songs of the Envoys. We may, we may stick it back into our repertoire again. Uh, what a powerful message, because I was, I was coming down the road this morning, and that just that that melody just kept reverberating in my heart. You know, sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we feel like we failed. Sometimes we feel like, you know, we're not living up to, uh, to our expectations and certainly realizing that we're not living up to, to what it is always that God has called us to do and to be. And, and we get maybe a little bit down in our spirit. And then the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us that uh, God doesn't love us because of what we do. God doesn't love us because even of what we are. He doesn't love us because of how spiritual we are, how godly we are, how holy we are. He just loves us because he chose to. He chose to love you. He chose to go to the cross for you. He chose to. What, what a great truth today. And that just caused such a melody, such a joy to rise up in my spirit as I was driving down here this morning, just to remember that Jesus died for me because he chose to, not because I deserve it, but because his love overwhelms any failure in my life and yours as well. You know, the last, oh, I don't know, weeks and months, I have just... I just have this growing sense of anticipation, this growing sense of anticipation that God is getting ready to do something in the earth. You know, we, uh, we, we, uh, we can look at the world, we can look at life around us, we can look at the way things are going, and we can get pretty depressed, we can get pretty, pretty down. And uh, I just, you know, I, I know this revival, spiritual renewal, awakenings, historically have come at the darkest hour, the, most, the spiritually darkest hour when God's people get desperate. Good morning, Kathy Steiner, all the way from the Great Smoky Mountains, place where I grew up. I done grew up there, Kathy. It's so good to see you on here. Revivals uh, are often characterized as a shaking. I want to talk about it a little bit this morning. Let me read for you just uh, a couple of passages of Scripture. A couple of passages of Scripture. The first one comes from the second chapter of Acts. Very familiar passage of Scripture. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit 
gave them utterance. And then I want to read another passage, just, just over in Acts chapter 4. Uh, and this is uh, a record of the disciples praying after Peter and John had been arrested uh, because they had healed this man in the temple courtyard. They had healed him in the name of Jesus. And the the, the Sadducees, the, the Sanhedrin, were very annoyed and they came with all sorts of breathing fire and threatenings and everything else. And uh, they prayed. They prayed. Uh, as a matter of fact, they said, and, and Lord, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak the word of God by stretching forth your hands to heal. Signs and wonders may be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. And then we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And I, I love that. And the place where they were gathered together was shaken. It literally was shaken. You know, it must have been quite a shaking on that Pentecost morning when all of the the Jews from around the world had gathered together for the Feast of Pentecost, and suddenly uh, the, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and the place where the disciples had gathered, waiting on the promise that Jesus said would come, it was shaken. It, it, it was shaken by the wind, and then there was the, these, the appearance of fire uh, resting upon each one of them. And you know what happened after that. They blew out into the streets and began to preach. And that day, 3,000 men uh, were uh, saved. Uh, you know, Duncan Campbell uh, was preaching in the Hebrides. He was one of the catalysts of the great Hebrides revival. And he tells the story of of them holding meeting after meeting after meeting with nothing happening. No, there was nothing, nobody was coming. Not, not only did, was nothing happening at the meetings, nobody was coming to the meetings. The bars were full and the dance halls were full and the church was empty and they were discouraged. And they went up the, the hill from the town and, uh, and uh, they, they just sat down discouraged and broken and began to pray. And, uh, and, and, uh, and as they prayed, they went around the room and they were praying and it was kind of dry and discouraged and broken. And, and finally, it came to one of the old farmers, I believe, if history, if my memory is correct, he was the guy who owned the house. He began to pray and he prayed something like this. He said, Lord, you promised you would pour out your, you would pour out water on the dry ground and you're not doing it. Wow, what a bold prayer, huh? That's a prayer of desperation. That's a prayer of brokenness. That's a prayer of, of men crying out to God when, when all of their efforts have failed. And history records that at that moment, that house began to shake. It was almost like an earthquake was building. Dishes began to fall off the rails and, and, and cups were falling out of the cabinets and, and things were sliding off of shelves and off of tables. And the men ran out. They ran out of the house, I guess, thinking an earthquake was coming. And they looked down and winding up the hill <clears throat> were lines, hundreds of people coming up the lines, carrying their lanterns drawn to that place by the Spirit of God, not drawn by any posters, not drawn by any promotional material, but drawn uh, uh, drawn by the Spirit of God. And by the hundreds, people came up the hill and they sat down on the ground and the preachers began to preach and there was a mighty move of God, uh, but there was this shaking and uh and earlier this spring, I tell you, we had a series of meetings, the end of May, uh, 1st of June. We had these, I mean, uh, the end of April, 1st of May, we had these meetings in which uh, we had a young fellow by the name of Tommy Zito and his team come in and we were holding meetings. And I, I'm telling you, there were, there were times when our little church up on Canal Street in Brattleboro was shaken with the presence of the Spirit of God. And I know many of our people were, we were shaken to the core uh, by what was God was doing. 
And uh, well, now we have a new visitor today, Ricardo Hugo Mustashi. Good to have you with us. We'll have to talk later, find out who you are and where you're from. So, so I believe, I believe with all of my heart, God is preparing to shake the church out of her, her crumbling foundations. You know, the, the, one of the prophecies of the last days is that there would be a great falling away uh, from the body of Christ. And, and we're seeing that. There's, there are many churches today that have abandoned the gospel. They're preaching a social gospel. They're preaching a, a, the gospel of tolerance. They are preaching even things that are opposed and against the word of God, supporting uh, all of the sexual perversion, supporting uh, the murder of children and things. And there's a great apostasy in the church today. But I believe that revival comes uh, during the darkest hour when God's people get desperate. And I, I believe with all of my heart that we are on the threshold of a real shaking in the body of Christ. And I'm I'm one of the biggest cheerleaders. I've read a couple of things this morning I want to share with you later on in the broadcast that just support that, that sense that I'm getting. And, and it tells me that, that I'm not the only one. There are other people who are just sensing something moving in the spiritual realm, something moving that uh, is uh, just causing a sense of anticipation to rise up in our spirits, believing that we're on the threshold of God doing something remarkable. You know, I've been preaching for some time now that uh, we're looking at uh, the coming, a coming revival, a coming movement in the household of God. And this is, this is what I've shared. This is what I believe with all of my heart. When God moves, when God's spirit comes upon the church, uh, it's going to be sudden. Uh, it's going to be, you know, at, at a time when things are the darkest, when things are the most desperate, when it seems like, it seems like that that all is lost. I think there's going to be a move of God that comes with such shocking suddenness, like it was on that day of Pentecost that we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, that suddenly... God is going to move on his church. And, and the other thing that I believe is that the move of God is going to be outrageous. It's just, it's just going to be outrageous. It's, it's not going to fit into any of our spiritual boxes. It's not going to look like anything that, you know, I, I know we all are praying for revival, but, but most of us already have a preconceived idea of what revival is and what it's going to look like. And uh, I'm just telling you that when God suddenly comes upon his church in a day which I believe is just around the corner, just over the horizon, God is going to move upon his church. It is not going to fit into any of our preconceived ideas about what revival looks like. Now, I'm talking about the, you know, the frozen chosen, and I'm talking about the, the, the lit up Pentecostals. We've got our idea of what the revival is going to look like. We've, we've all got our preconceived ideas, and I am telling you, this next move of God is not going to fit into any of our boxes. There are going to be people who have trouble even accepting that this is a move of God because it will be so outside of the realm of expectation. God does not conform to my ideas about how he ought to move and how he ought to act, and he doesn't conform to yours or anybody else. God is God. He sits on his throne. He will do what he chooses to do. And I say, go for it, God. Just blow us up. That's been my prayer in recent days, that he'll just come into the church and he will just blow everything up and say, let's start all over. I'm going to give you a whole new concept of what it means to live in fellowship with God. Uh, you know, on that day of Pentecost, this, just looking over some things, I, I love, I learned a new word last week as I was preparing for a preaching at a local church in our area. I learned a new word. And it's called uh, homothumadon, homothumadon. It's a Greek word, and it's the word that was used in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, 
when it says when the day of Pentecost arrived, or some, some versions say when the day of Pentecost was fully come, meaning that it was at its peak, the disciples, the ones that saw Jesus ascend from the Mount of Olives into heaven, the disciples who were told, after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, those people who were told to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise that would come from the Father, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were homothumadon. They were all together in one place. Now, this, this word is used 12 times, I think, in the New Testament. Uh, 10 times uh, it, is, it occurs in the book of Acts. And, of course, the book of Acts is the record of the, of the establishment of the church by the Holy Spirit. And, and it helps us, if we understand what this word means, it helps us to understand the uniqueness of the Christian community. Homothumadon, it, it means, is two, it's a compound word, and it means to rush along in unison. To rush along in unison. Homo means one and the same. Uh, thumos means temperament, of the same temperament the same emotion of the mind, the same, uh, uh, it's an adverb which denotes the unity of a group, and it means with the same emotion, with the same passion, of one persuasion, of, of one desire, one mind, one accord, one purpose, one impulse, all together, unanimously, with unanimous consent, pertaining to mutual consent, you know I looked all this up, right? So I'm reading it from my notes. Uh, by common consent, simultaneously as one, homothumadon uh, describes the harmony of views and feelings and singleness of purpose. No schisms, no divisions, no divided interests, no discordant purposes. It's almost a musical image, like an orchestra that's getting ready to play. I use this illustration, you know, if you're gone, if you go to a concert and you're sitting out and the curtains closed before the orchestra begins their concert, you can hear the first uh, violin who, who plays a note and then all of the other instruments uh, in the orchestra uh, tune their instruments to that one tone of the first chair violin. And, and then the curtain opens and there's silence and the conductor raises his baton, and with one movement, this, this incredible collection of instruments, high instruments, low instruments, stringed instruments, brass instruments, uh, woodwinds, all of these, the drums, the timpanis, in one instant they strike. It's, it's almost an overwhelming sudden sound that comes, and it's absolutely perfectly harmonized and unified and connected together and all being led by the baton in the conductor's hand. And that's what happened in the church on the day of Pentecost. These people had prayed for, they were, in, they were there for 10 days waiting on this promise, whatever it was that they had no idea what it was going to look like or what it was going to sound like or what it was going to do. They just knew that Jesus told them to go and to wait, and they were waiting. And then on the morning, about nine o'clock in the morning, as they were praying and worshiping, suddenly the orchestra began to play. The, the, the conductor uh, tapped the baton and began the concert and a great concerto of praise and worship and declaration came out of that upper room and those people blew into the streets and they began uh, it was wonderful because the next verse tells us and suddenly there there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting suddenly uh, are you I'm, i want to set something in your spirit today i want to i want to engender a sense of anticipation, uh, anticipation that one morning we're going to get up. Maybe we'll go to church. Maybe we won't. Maybe just around the globe, the Holy Spirit will somehow create the spirit of homothumadon, and the church will be bound together as one. And when that happens, 
That seems to be the key. That seems to be the kickoff. That seems to be the thing that initiated everything was suddenly these people were in absolute concert together. Absolute concert together. All of their spiritual instruments were tuned and ready to play. Oh, my goodness. That's not the condition of the church today, but I believe that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to bring a spirit of homothumidon, this, this concerto of spiritual uh, sound that will burst forth from the church under the direction of our great conductor, the Holy Spirit. And when that happened, you know, uh, there, were, there came this mighty rushing wind. Uh, there were tongues of fire that sat upon them. And they all began to speak in languages uh, that they did not know, that they had not learned. Uh, you know, Jesus, John said, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me will baptize you with fire. Now, baptism means to be immersed, to be immersed. Whether it's water or fire, we are to be immersed in it. Now, the wind... The wind is always a, a metaphor or a symbol in scriptural terminology of the Holy Spirit. And fire is always a metaphor or a symbol of the presence of God. So what happened was with the God, the Holy Spirit came into that room and ushered in the presence of God, the Father. And these people all began to declare the glories of Jesus, God the Son. And this, the whole of the Trinity was manifested in that hour. And there was a powerful move of God. It wasn't like anything anyone had ever seen before. We know that because as soon as word got out, people came running from everywhere to see what this, what in the world is going on here? What in the world is going on? And they came running from everywhere. Now, we know that fire also represents purity and holiness. And so God the Father brought his holiness upon the church. But th this next part, uh, to me, is part of the most exciting thing. And I want to get to it quickly because I want to share something I read online today. Good morning, Thomas Morgan. Good morning, Cindy Rogers. Uh, as they burst into the streets and they began to speak un inexplicably, they, they, they were praising God and all of a sudden they were speaking in languages that they had not learned. These were not angelic tongues. These were not what we call unknown tongues. And I don't even want to get into that today. That's a, that's a discussion for another day. But they were speaking in languages that they had not learned. And the scriptures list off all of the various uh, international Jews, groups that were there from all over the known world. And they were stunned and they were amazed that every one of them was hearing the mighty works of God in their own language. They were, they were dumbfounded, and they wanted to know, what in the world is this? What is, what is going on? And, and listen, here's, here's what I, I want to I drive this point home because it is so important. You know, we, we, get, we, we start talking about being filled with the Spirit of the baptism and the Holy Spirit. Some of my friends, the minute I say the baptism and the Holy Spirit, they shut me off because they don't want to hear that stuff. They don't believe in it. They don't they don't. They don't, they won't want to touch that. You know, they've seen all of the phoniness and everything else. Don't do that. Do not dim dismiss the holy work of God through the Holy Spirit because you've seen some charlatan somewhere misuse the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Don't throw what God is going to do out, as they say, the, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Listen to me. There's coming a day when the Holy Spirit is going to fall on the church in unprecedented power. It's going to shake us to our core. It's going to shake off all the worldliness. It's going to purify us. It's going to burn out all of the godlessness that's attached itself to the, to the church like barnacles on the bottom of a boat. He's going to clean all of that off. He's going to clean us up. He's going to unify us, this homothumadon, and then he's going to fill us with power so that we can preach the gospel and we can do whatever we need to do to lead men to Christ. 
That's what the whole gift of the Holy Spirit was. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses. And so he is. He came that day, and he gave them the power and the ability, because they didn't have the ability to speak in all of these various languages. He gave them that ability, and what did they do? Well, they preached the gospel. They preached the cross. They preached the gospel of salvation. Uh, I, I get so tired of we want to see a move of the Holy Spirit, and we think it's about healing, or we think it's about prophecy, or we think it's about you know, this, that, or the other thing, the demonstrations, the manifestation, well, the Holy Spirit came to make us powerful witnesses so that we could preach the gospel. And under the anointing of the power of God, the gospel will bring men to Christ. That's what the whole purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit was. And we have made it everything but that. You know, I... I worked for a number of years in East Africa with uh, a school for the deaf, worked for more than 10 years with the deaf in that East African country of Kenya. And uh, one of the great joys that I had in presenting this is I traveled all over the world to, to raise support and to get support for this work there. Very, very important work that the wonderful miracle that had happened to these deaf children were that they were able to hear the gospel in their own language in their language of sign. It's miraculous because it was spirit-powered. It's wonderful because it demonstrates that whatever we need to do to bring men to Christ, God will provide us with it. Peter stood up and he began to preach and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, read the whole scripture because I don't have time this morning, but he preached the gospel. He said, this is that, these men are, that were accused of being drunk, he said, these men aren't drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. We hadn't even had time to get to the bars yet. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And then he reminded them of what Joel had prophesied that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. And then he began to preach the gospel. That's coward, this denier. Now no longer a coward, no longer a denier. He got the courage and he began to proclaim the gospel. And uh, he proclaimed, there is no other name under heaven by which a man might be saved. And when the gospel is preached with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it's not dead, it's not dry, it doesn't drive men away, it draws them, it creates in them a hunger, and it convicts them of their sin. That's one of the things Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do. He would convict men of their sin, and that day, men, <clears throat> the Bible says, they were stabbed in their heart. They were they were, they were quickened. Their spirit came alive. It had been dead to godly things, but now it came alive. And they cried out to the apostles, men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter said, repent. Repent. Turn from your sins and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, listen, this this is, I want you to see what happened here. Don't miss it. Boy, I'm getting so far behind. I, I may have to come back next week and do uh, part two of this. Uh, this was so different than what happened so often today. Peter and the other disciples, they didn't start holding miracle meetings. They didn't start holding miracle count, healing councils. They didn't, they didn't start holding prophetic conferences. They just preached the gospel. And every time God moved and every time he did a miracle, uh, men came running because men are attracted to the spectacular. They're attracted to the unusual. They're attracted to things that can't be explained. But they didn't, use, they didn't promote their gifting. They promoted the gospel. And, and this is so important. You know, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John um, healed a man in the temple courtyard. Uh, uh, being, from being lame, and people came running from everywhere, and Peter began to preach what? He began to preach the gospel of salvation, 
Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And then they were arrested and they were thrown in jail and then they were threatened and they were told you cannot preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they said, nope, sorry, we're going to have to disobey that command. They went back and they prayed together. And this is their prayer. I love their prayer. And God, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak the word of God by stretching forth your hand to heal. Signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child Jesus. Now, why did they want signs and wonders to be done? To create the platform from which they could preach the gospel. It's far more important for a lame man to receive salvation than it is strength in his legs. But God gave him strength in his legs so he would be willing to hear the gospel, as would others. Give us, give us miracles, give us signs, give us wonders to draw attention to Jesus so that men might listen to the gospel. And when the Holy Spirit came, they received that. And the place where they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Oh, my goodness. That's, that, I believe, is what we are facing in this day. I believe there is coming a shaking that is going to shake this world. First, shake the church, but it's going to be a shaking that is this is going to reverberate around the globe. Are you sensing it? Can you get can you say God make me sensitive to what you're about to do? I don't know how many of you know Dutch Sheets. Uh he's a he has a real prophetic voice. He has a real intercessor's heart and and uh he writes on his Facebook, his social media page. He does a thing called Give Him 15 and he brings a little devotional uh, in the mornings, and and my wife reads we, every time Dutch Sheet puts one out, and she'll say, "You got to read this. You got to read this," and and sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. But this morning, I read Dutch Sheet's uh, article because its headline caught me: "Prepare for Revival." And and I just want to share. I've got just a few minutes left. I want to share with you some of the things that Dutch Sheet says. He says this. Let me. I'm reading right now. Larry Sparks has written one of the best books on revival I have read in years. The title, Pentecostal Fire, is taken from the outpouring of, whole, of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Books such as this assure me of a coming revival, as do the young revivalists I see being prepared. I'm also encouraged by the strategies and plans God is giving to many of his leaders, preparing them for the coming move of his spirit. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Prepare us for the coming move of his spirit. And then Dutch Sheet goes on. And then, of course, there are the prophecies being released regarding the Holy Spirit's amazing plans. These are just a few of the reasons I do not fear any shaking that may occur to restore America. The shaking will prepare us, not destroy us. So Dutch Sheets, along with others, including myself, are just anticipating a great shaking that's coming. Through Larry's powerful and though Larry's powerful and stirring book is filled with principles about preparing for and entering into revival, in the final chapter, he challenges us regarding three idols we must address. Here is a portion of that chapter. I hope I've got time to finish this this morning. Here is a portion of that chapter. This is Larry Sparks. He says, I believe there are three idols that need to be identified, confronted, and demolished in order for us to make room for Pentecostal fire to manifest. It's available now, but as it was in the days of Jesus' birth, there's no room at the end. We've not made room for the wild move of Pentecostal fire because like the inn in the Christmas story, we have filled our modern inns with other things. Simply stated, there is no space for Pentecost because we have filled God's space with things he never asked for. 
Oh, boy, does that ring true to me. There's so many things going on in the church today. God didn't ask for. God doesn't want. There's no, but, but they take up room. They take up room in our minds. They take up room in our hearts. They take up room in the program. And there, there's just no place for the Holy Spirit to, to, to fit in. And so now Larry Sparks outlines three idols, three idols that are present in the church today. And the first uh, thing he says is the idol of reputation, the idol of reputation. And now he quotes revivalist Vance Havner. I believe with all my soul that when we quit depending on our gadgets and gimmicks and stand on nothing but the promises of God, risking our reputation and future on it, staking everything on a miracle instead of on men and machinery and mere money, the fire will fall. We're living in an era, this is Larry Sparks now, we're living in an era when the possibility of having a popular reputation being followed by millions of people and thus financially benefiting from said reputation is unlike any other moment in history. We have entered the day of the celebrity, pa celebrity yeah, I'll say it in a minute, celebrity pastor. The great revivalist of old, Jonathan Edwards, Smith Wigglesworth, Evan Roberts, even down to A.W. Tozer, Leonard Ravenhill, and Catherine Kuhlman, have left an imprint on history, preaching uncompromised truth without having any social media stature or high-yield email list. If you decide to lay down preaching truth, or trade welcoming the wild move of the Holy Spirit in order to be popular and polished, your efforts may result in temporary superficial success, but make no mistake, the truly spiritual will discern a lack of weight on what you share and speak. We need to heed and follow the words of the Apostle Paul, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. We need to demolish the idol of fame or popularity, or as Larry Sparks says, reputation. We have too many celebrities in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what, friend. There's only one celebrity in the body of Christ, in the living church, and that is Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord. He's our celebrity. John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. And the more I increase, the less people can see Jesus. Did you hear what I said? The more popular I become, the more greater my reputation becomes, the less people can see Jesus. The second idol that Larry Sparks says that we need to throw down is the idol of religion. Now he quotes C. Peter Wagner. The spirit of religion is an agent of Satan, a sign to prevent change and to maintain the status quo by using religious, excuse me, devices. Larry Sparks goes on. The spirit of religion is not restrained to churches that feature pews, stained glass windows, holy water, and organ music. In fact, I find the spirit to be more prevalent and more insidious, working destructively and covertly in contemporary sanctuaries, especially charismatic churches. Often those who claim a more, <clears throat> excuse me, often those who claim a more charismatic or Pentecostal theology accuse the more traditional churches of being religious, when in fact those who know the things of the Spirit and have tasted of the powers of the ages to come can be the ones who actually miss God. They have, perhaps, fallen into the greatest snare of the serpent. They value concepts. Listen to this. This hurts. This is an ouch moment. They value concepts, conferences, events, 
receiving prophetic words, falling on the ground, speaking in tongues, and even prophesying about the new move of the Holy Spirit more than the demonstration and movement itself. Bottom line, the spirit of religion, <clears throat> excuse me, resist any forward movement for the kingdom of God, seeking to influence honest believers into embracing the present state of Christianity as a ceiling and a lid that cannot be moved. The spirit of religion especially loves 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Now that verse, by the way, for those of you who don't know, 1 Corinthians 14, 40 is let all things be done in decently and in de decently and in order. Earlier in the book, this is Larry Sparks, earlier in the book, I wrote a whole chapter on the idea of decently and in order and how God has a vision of Holy Spirit order that is often different from our comfort zone of spiritual preference. The spirit of religion will preach this verse out of context with great volume, insisting that anything that looks unusual, uncomfortable, or wild is certainly not the orderly, gentlemanly operation of the Holy Spirit. Wow. I read that several times and I went, ouch, he's talking about me. He's talking about the great heroes of the, of the charismatic movement. He's talking about us, friends. We, we look at the, you know, the Anglicans and the Episcopalians and the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians and the Baptists and all those guys and say, those guys are full of religion. We're just as full of it. It just looks different. And we need to get the lid off and let God do what he wants to do. The third thing that Larry Sparks should talk about, the third idol, is the idol of rigidity. And here's the question he asks. Are we willing to be disrupted by God? Outbreaks of Pentecostal fire are released by breaker people who partner with heaven's divine interruptions. Duncan Campbell, the evangelist who was catalytic in the Hebrides revival, describes one of the key events that broke open the region for the Holy Spirit outpouring. Here's the scene. Witnessed during the first days of the movement, a crowded church. The service is over. The congregation, reluctant to disperse, stands outside the church in a silence that is tense. Suddenly, a cry is heard within. A young man burdened for the souls of his fellow men, is pouring out his soul in intercession. He prays until he falls into a trance and lies prostrate on the floor of the church. But heaven has heard. And the congregation, moved by a power they could not resist, came back into the church. And a wave of conviction of sin swept over the gathering moving strong men to cry out. And I'm talking about audibly. This young man was wailing. He was crying out audibly. And a wave of conviction swept over the gathering, moving strong men to cry out for God for mercy. This service continued until the wee hours of the morning. Note what happened. The cry was heard from the young man, pouring out his soul in intercession. In the modern church, such would be observed as a distraction or an interruption. Yes, even not decent and in order. Yeah, there are fleshly responses that are not Holy Spirit motivated. I agree. But I'm concerned, this is Larry Sparks, but I am concerned that we have become so hard of spiritually seeing and hearing, as the priest Eli was in the days of Hannah and Samuel, that we automatically assume that all interruptions are the flesh. Rigidity shuts down divine interruption. Let me repeat that, church. Let me repeat that, brothers and sisters. Rigidity shuts down divine interruption because there's no time in the meeting no schedule, no space 
in the schedule, or we simply assume that all interruptions are fleshly. The Welsh Revival of 1904, I'm continuing to read Larry Sparks, the Welsh Revival of 1904 had Evan Roberts boldly praying, Bend me, O Lord. Azusa Street in 1906 saw William Seymour baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, inviting the nations to enter into that same experience. The Toronto Blessing saw Randy Clark ministering on January 20th, 1994 at the Airport Vineyard Church, Toronto, Canada, simply sharing his testimony and then giving the church an opportunity to come forward and to receive a touch from God. The Brownsville Revival was largely catalyzed by John Kilpatrick being dramatically overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit on Father's Day in 1995. These invasions of heaven were birthed into the earth by a person boldly welcoming the Holy Spirit's move and making room for his interruption in their midst. There is no room for rigidity when we claim to truly desire the authentic move of the Holy Spirit. What am I saying this morning? I'm saying we need to prepare our hearts for what God is about to do. For regardless of how, what any future shaking of me or how severe it might be, I'm going, to, I'm going to guarantee you it will be followed by an incredible revival. Corrective actions and discipline from God are to mature us and to prepare us not to destroy us. You need to prepare yourself for the Holy Spirit's great outpouring because it's coming. I'm telling you, in my spirit, I know it. It's coming. God is going to move on his church in an unprecedented way, something that you and I cannot calculate, something that you and I cannot manufacture, something that you and I cannot create. We can't work it up. We can't sing it up. We can't shout it up. It's going to come from heaven, and it's going to shake us to our very core. It's going to correct us. It's going to discipline. It's going to chasten us. It's going to bring us to our knees in divine humility. It's going to break our hearts. It's going to break our spirits. It's going to break everything in us until we are like dust before God. And then he's going to revive his church. He's going to revive his church. I want, I want to read for you uh, Dutch Sheet's prayer. He closed his his uh, post this morning with this prayer, and I've got just about enough time to do it. Father. You are determined to reap a harvest of unprecedented proportions. Your love demands it. Christ paid for it, and the Holy Spirit will generate it. As we prepare to partner with you in this, we are not afraid of any work you must do to prepare us. We know your heart is merciful, and your discipline as a father to prepare us for greater fruitfulness. As we prepare, we choose to operate in the mind of Christ, who emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. We renounce and lay down the idols we have made of our reputations. In the future, we will seek to please you, not men. Many in the church have chosen popularity over speaking truth. Deliver us from this and replace it with a spirit of humility and boldness. And we ask you show us any places in our lives where we have tolerated a religious spirit turning to form without power or have prioritized religious actions and works over intimacy with you. Forgive us for protecting our comfort zones with a false interpretation of decently and in order. We want your order, which is sometimes shocking in its intensity and uncomfortable to our flesh. And we choose to become more flexible, rejecting the absurdity of putting you in man-made boxes. We determine to be pliable wineskins that can handle new wine. We do not care what revival looks like as long as it comes from you. We also choose humility, acknowledging that we don't know what your actions will look like, only that they are good, always. 
We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Prepare. Prepare your heart. Chastening will come. Shaking will come. A lot of the, you know, God shakes things so that, so that, so, so that everything that can be moved will move. You know, uh, uh, Jamie Buckingham once said, you know what happens when, when everything around you begins to shake, like in an earthquake, you look to find something that won't move. And so when God begins to shake, he drives us to the word of God. He drives us to our walk with God. Amen. God is going to put you on solid ground. He's going to shake you to your core. He's going to shake. He's going to, I believe he's going to destroy. He's going to allow churches to be destroyed, literally destroyed because of their unfaithfulness, because of their idolatry, because of their religion, because of their rigidity. He's going to, he's going to shut down churches. They're going to fail. And to those of us that he uh, that desire and hunger for his move, he's going to move in, and boy, he's going to drive a lot of the a lot of the money changing tables out of our houses, uh, the things that we have brought in to replace him, so that his house will once again become a house of prayer, a place where God's people are seeking him, a place where the the man behind the desk is just a mouthpiece for the Holy Spirit. He's going to shake us, folks. Revival is coming, but a shaking precedes it. And then in the darkest hour, look for it. Listen for the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Listen, be sensitive to the shaking that's beginning. It's going to shake the house. We're all going to speak the word of God with boldness. And men are going to be saved. That day's coming. It's coming. Let's not, let's not fail to anticipate. Let's look for it. I'm Mike Ant. This is Mornings with Mike. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all the church said amen. And those of you who've been listening on live stream, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause your heart to be filled with joy. I'll be back here. Actually, I won't be on the air live next week. Uh, I'm going to be on the radio doing the pre-recorded message because I'll be at camp. But I am going to try to be on the air on next Tuesday morning from camp. Maybe I'll give you a report on camp meeting. God bless you. Temptations, hidden snares, often take us unawares. But our hearts are made to bleed for each thought, less a word or deed. And we wonder why the test, when we try to do our best, we will understand it better by and by.
Sit outside my Jesus. I'm gonna sit right.